Welcome to the Inner West Library Speaker Series. Before we begin today, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal and Wongal people of the Aurora Nation on which this podcast is produced and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging from across all lands this podcast reaches. Ronnie Khan is a South African-born Australian social entrepreneur and founder of the food rescue charity Oz Harvest. She is an advocate, lobbyist and activist renowned for distributing the food waste landscape in Australia. She appears regularly in national media, serves in an advisory capacity to government and is a keynote speaker all over the world. Her mission towards sustainable action is supported through close collaborations with some of the world's finest chefs, including Jamie Oliver, Massimo Bottura, Neil Perry and Bill Granger. Ronnie is an officer of the Order of Australia, AO, and was named Australian Local Hero of the Year in 2010. In 2018, her journey became the subject of a feature film, Food Fighter, directed by Dan Goldberg. A Repurposed Life is co-written with Jessica Chapnick-Khan. Welcome, Ronnie. Thank you so much. And I too would just like to acknowledge that I meet you on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And wherever anyone's listening to acknowledge our, the value of our Indigenous custodians of this land. Ronnie, your autobiography is immensely inspiring and extremely motivational. How does one choose what to add and what to leave out when being so honest about their life? Well, that is one incredible question because I spent years thinking about what would go in and what wouldn't. And in fact, what went in was never what I'd expected to go in. (laughs) So, (laughs) So it is always a very, very challenging thing a life is so full and then you land up having to pick and choose but luckily working with my daughter-in-law my co-author Jessica Chapnick Khan that made it easier in a way because she made some of the decisions that I would never have made but seemed to have turned out to be good ones (laughs) oh that's great (laughs) Ronnie you grew up in South Africa during the time of apartheid. In your book, A Repurposed Life, you mentioned that you were watching on television Nelson Mandela walking out of jail. If you had the opportunity to talk to him, what would you say to him? What would you ask him? Look, I think the first thing I would say is just the deep gratitude for the role model that he he represented globally. I think to go from hating people to loving and accepting them and forgiveness is one of the most extraordinary qualities that any human being can show. Yeah. And so I probably would ask him a little bit about that journey from knowing how hatred would not serve him to where forgiveness became his modus operandi. Because I do believe that that is his greatest gift. Wow, amazing. Well, he was an incredible, incredible human being. And if I think about inspirational leaders today, there are very few that come close to him. Yes, I totally agree with you. Ronnie, can you tell us a little bit about your time in Israel and what it was like living in the kibbutz? Apologies if I didn't pronounce that properly. No, you did. Kibbutz is exactly how it's pronounced. <laughs> you know, it was a fascinating time, given that I'd left apartheid South Africa and gone to live in a country which seemed incredibly free, broad, open. And South Africa during the apartheid era was incredibly closed and internally based. Well, that also because nobody from the outside wanted to have anything to do with South Africa. But Going to Israel, so Israel itself as a country, very open, very multicultural. And and then actually landing up living on a kibbutz, which is a socialist way of life. So from complete inequality to total equality was this enormous contrast. But such a wonderful learning curve to see that one could value people for who they are, for what they do not for how they look and not for their race. Now, having said that, of course, Israel is a very complex country, so I'm not going into the politics there. But for me at that time, that's what I saw and that's what I experienced. 
And that's what I try to write and share a little bit about in the book. It's very interesting. I must say that part. It really was. Mm. Well, it's very hard to conceive of living in a socialist society, number one, and living where everybody works according to their ability and really gets according to their need. And it does sound so idyllic. And in some ways it really is, but also it's very challenging. Yeah, I know. You didn't like it very much, did you? Well, I did. I loved it, ideally, you know, in an ideological sense. It's yes. just that in the reality of being told, you're going to go and work here, you're going to go and do this, yeah. this is where you need to be at this time, is quite challenging for an independent mind who actually hadn't um, ideologically chosen to go and live there. I did live there in the first instance because of my husband. And so whilst he believed in it, loved it, lived it, breathed it, you know, fully ideologically, I didn't. So there was a challenge for me. But it was an experience. Phenomenal, phenomenal experience and one where I created the best friendships that have lasted to this day. So very, very precious. Ronnie, can you talk briefly about the big corporate event that you held and the ridiculous amount of food that was left over that made you seriously start thinking about food waste? Absolutely, because it certainly wasn't the first event that in a way food waste had really come up in front of me, but it was one that was just so obnoxious that it actually compelled me to act. So in my previous life in my event life I was producing and putting on wonderful events to mark either a unique moment in the life of a business or an individual so if it was a party or a wedding or a birthday or an anniversary or a corporate major event or conference and so the one thing that was common at all these events is food because food is a beautiful aggregator and food is also a way of showing generosity. So when a client wanted to show, an employer wanted to show their clients or their, their customers how successful they were, they'd put on an event and one of the best ways to show that was to have abundant food. And I was very good at producing abundant food, magnificently. But at this particular event, I chose that the theme would be like a Roman banquet. And so because it was for a thousand people, there were just mass stalls everywhere, but like a marketplace. And in every stall, there was just duplications of produce, fresh produce. So we're talking... 25 years ago, I was very, and 20 years ago, I was very, my events were quite ahead of their time in that we'd use fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, masses, baskets of grapes hanging, kegs of wine, barrels of beer, all abundantly displayed. And this was an event for a thousand people. And they walked through and went straight to the beautiful bars that were abundantly displayed. And within a very short while, I put all the food there so that they didn't get drunk. But they went and drank first and got so drunk that they didn't eat the food. And so suddenly there were these just stations full of food. Previously, you, you're always in a unique venue. You're off-site. You're not in... Most of my events didn't take place in a hotel. And so suddenly I had all this wonderful food that normally the caterer would take care of and would just probably dispose of, but really not as visible to me. This particular night was so visible that I couldn't let that food go to waste. And I loaded up my van, but also my little sports car and just filled it up and went to the one place that I really knew of and took that food there. And one, it was incredibly confronting because it was very late at night and there were masses of people around the entrance to this hostel. But two, it, it actually turned out to be very easy once I'd done it. And so actually it was the trigger because that night showed me that actually I never had to waste food again because when I knocked on the door and said, would you like this beautiful quality, perfectly good food, that hasn't been touched, they just said, you better believe it. 
and that really was the beginning of my rogue food rescue days because it certainly wasn't legit in terms of it just was me making sure that I wasn't going to waste food again. A big eye opener, I bet. Absolutely enormous. And I didn't even know then the state or the, the amount of need there was, nor did I know how important it was to stop food going to waste, and nor did I know how much food was going to waste. All I kind of had thought of was very micro. I had food waste. It didn't occur to me until then that if I had food waste, other event producers had food waste. And I hadn't even gone further than that to think, well, other businesses might have. That all emerged and grew once I started doing this more. Ronnie, you moved mountains to change the Civil Liabilities Act of New South Wales. Can you talk about this and also a little about the Good Samaritan Act? Yeah, so the Good Samaritan Act, well, again, once I had started rescuing food, again, it didn't occur to me that I couldn't do this. It just seemed I had food and there were people who were hungry. I should just do this. Um, but it became apparent that some businesses really weren't that keen to give me food. Once I realized that, that I could get more and more food, um, some of those people said absolutely, but some said, well, actually, no. What happens if somebody gets ill when they eat our food? That didn't make sense to me because if they got ill when they ate the food that I'd given them or an hour later. But anyway, I had to listen to that. Now, it turns out that there was a Good Samaritan Act in Victoria that meant that if you gave something away for free, um, it was an act of charity, an act of like a Good Samaritan, and that was an acceptable act. Um, I didn't really know that it already existed in Victoria, but what I did know was in New South Wales, I needed to make it possible for anyone who wanted to give food away to give it to us. So the only thing I knew to do was to call on some of the people I'd worked with in the past in my business, some legal eagles, and called top legal firm and said, I'm going to need help. Here's what I need. And of course, I didn't have a budget. I had nothing. I just said, I need your help to help me make pass a law that it is nobody's liability if good food gets given away and somebody gets ill, so that the actual food donor is not liable. And, and I had beautiful success with law, a law firm coming on board, and they lobbied, and we lobbied, and lobbied, and I was there niggling them in the background because they knew what they had to do. And um, every time they said, oh, it's quite a tough thing, I'd say, well, we're not giving up now, keep going. <laughs> you made me laugh. I read the part when you did meet with a legal firm that it wasn't only one yeah. person in there, there was five people in there because they didn't know what you were going to ask them when you'd yes. show up. Yes, because in my past, I had used this firm to help me with some legal cases. There was a, during the Olympics, I'd had an issue where someone had booked us and a week before the Olympics changed their mind and then wanted their, wanted their deposit back and didn't want to pay even though there'd been a very strong contract that said if you pull out. So they, they loved my challenges because they were a major <laughs> legal firm and they dealt with billions of dollars and then, then there was this little person who came and said please help me. <laughs> and they thought it was another one of those cases and, and obviously I paid for the previous ones. But when I walked through the door and there were five lawyers, I said, okay, I'm wonderful to see you all. But this one, you're not making any money on. <laughs> but they agreed and they were wonderful. That's really funny. <laughs> okay, Ronnie, I need to ask you. I love the colour yeah. yellow. Of all the colours in the spectrum, why choose yellow and black as your signature style? Did the wonderful story of the Wizard of Oz have anything to do with it and why? Okay, well, let's go first. Yellow is bright, smiley, and the color yes. of the sun. And to me, that just embodied warmth and joyfulness, but also highly visible. I mean, the sun shines, everybody smiles, and the, the state of the world changes. So I figured I've, always, I've loved yellow, but never to the extent that I love yellow now. <laughs> <laughs> never to the extent that everything about, you know, that my blood runs yellow. I didn't, it, it didn't run yellow then. But it just felt like it was very visible. I figured 
if signposts were done in yellow, it meant that it was visible. So if our vehicles were yellow, they would be seen. They me. are seen from a mile they away, are. Ronnie. I know. they like busy bees buzzing around. Now, let's get to the Wizard of Oz. If you think about the yellow brick road, the, the lion, the courage, I, I, I definitely think it was there in the background and it became a beautiful thing to it to connect it with. But quite honestly, it was yellow because it was so visible, so bright, so happy. And that's what I wanted us to be known for. This organization that comes in to make sure. I mean, there isn't a single person who wants to see good that's food right. go to waste. I didn't even have to teach them. Their grandmothers, their aunts, their uncles, somebody in a family has told somebody don't waste your food because they're people starving. Then love your leftovers. Exactly. Love your leftovers, you know. Eat your peas else because there's someone starving in China or Africa. Well, I always wanted to send my peas to those <laughs> people. But, but now I get to deliver those peas. <laughs> we see the um, your Oz Harvest trucks around the inner west so frequently. They're just so cheerful and they're, you can see drivers are on the mission. They know where they're going. They probably don't have a GPS. They know exactly where they're going and they're on a mission. I see them all the time here. And you know what's so interesting? If our vehicle breaks down and a driver goes out in a white vehicle and not our marked branded vehicles, they say it is a completely different experience. Oh, wow. When they're in a yellow vehicle, people smile at them. People stop, give way. People literally see this as a rescue yes. vehicle, a vehicle doing good. They say the difference when you're in an unmarked vehicle, people are rude and what? grumpy oh, on the road. Oh, goodness. But, but they never experience that when you're a yellow Oz Harvest Oh, driver. wow. Mm, that's an interesting Very phenomenon. interesting, very. Ronnie, you have mentored so many people. Who would you say was your biggest mentor that inspired you the most to keep on going? Ah, oh, that's such an interesting one. You know, certainly in the book I mentioned Selma yes. Brody. And it wasn't that she ever said to me, Ronnie, that's just do this, do this, do this. And I'd call her and she'd say, do this, do this. That was not how our mentorship worked. It was really her actions that inspired me and her own never giving up on many different things. So subliminally, definitely she did. You know, my mother did so many things and never gave up. So I actually do believe that energetically I imbibe this notion of resilience yes. and ability not to give up. But there just were so, I mean, again, you know, I mentioned Nelson Mandela because as a role model, he is an extraordinary human being that if one could model oneself, he would be one. You know, there were different people along the way who've serviced, who've, who've literally served me, who've come and offered their support that have been so incredible. So, so the list is long. Yeah, I, I can imagine. <laughs> and now just all I hope to give back is that I could make a small difference to somebody that along the way they may never remember where they found that piece of information or what inspired them. But if I've affected change then that is a beautiful thing. I wouldn't say a small difference. You've made a huge difference, Ronnie. Well, thank you. There's a long, a long way to go and a lot oh, more to do. Well, you're very busy. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Ronnie, during COVID, I can imagine more and more people were reliant on the services that Otter Harvest provided. You and your team being on the front line would have seen the need firsthand. How did you keep up with the demand for food when the hospitality business was not booming and there was hardly any food to rescue? Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, COVID really brought us and has affected the demographic that we service significantly. I mean, there's there's really been a 48% uplift to need in the last year. So there were huge fluctuations of food, demand, charities closing. But honestly, the resilience of my team, um, we, I managed to keep every staff member. We redeployed, we redesigned, 
we lobbied for government funding because suddenly for the first time ever we had to purchase food. We've never had to purchase food. There's always been enough food to rescue. That is what Oz Harvest is built on. But during COVID, we've had to purchase food because so many more people needed food. So we rolled out about 20 new programs. Wow. And in fact, landed up having to hire more people, to deliver more food, to make sure we could make the biggest impact ever. And quite honestly, during this last year, we've delivered and diverted over 8,881,000 kilos of food from going to landfill. And in fact, we delivered the equivalent of 31 million seven hundred. 85,000 meals. Oh, wow. Year. I know, it's amazing. We cooked meals. We, we had never really cooked meals, but charities closed, so we needed to find a way to reach people who didn't have the capacity yes. to get out, who would normally have gone and got ready-made food. So we cooked over seven, almost 700,000 cooked meals together with us and some hospitality heroes, we call them, our partners, who helped us cook to make sure that we could deliver more food. We worked with 37 hospitality chefs, businesses, to help us support making food, but, and which in turn helped those people because it employed them. So everyone got together. Everyone did a huge collaboration. We delivered over 110,000 hampers because we created pop-up feeding hubs um, because many international students, temporary visa holders, yeah. and people who were not given job seeker yes. or were not supported in any way needed food boxes. And the beautiful thing is we call them essential food boxes. Our recipients call them dignity boxes because they were created and curated with such care. It's such a wonderful story, it really is. How did you, I didn't ask you a question about your free supermarket, but how did you keep filling the shelves yeah. at the free, free yeah, supermarket? Yeah, exactly. Well, it had to turn into a hamper hub because we couldn't let people walk through because our supermarket's quite small. So we literally converted into the same amount of people, 300 or more people would come a day at least. But we'd hand out hampers, that included fresh produce, that included some dry goods, included ready cooked meals. So we did that daily. And yeah, that's how we managed to deliver over 110,000. Wow. Yeah. Ronnie, your chapter, One Little Starfish, was so heartwarming. Can you talk a little about Hilton Harmer? Well, I should, if, if at all I should talk about a mentor or an inspiration, <laughs> it is this extraordinary human being, Hilton Harmer. So he's an ex-Salvos um, officer, yes. devoted his life. But if I've ever met a true Christian, and I use the word Christian not in the religious sense, but in the sense of someone who cares about others, who literally has taken off his shoes to give to someone who didn't have shoes on their feet. So he's an extraordinary human being and wakes up every day and says, thank you, God, that I can serve people and do more good. So a very exquisite human being, which is why the chapter on him is quite long, but I just felt there was nothing in it that I wanted to change. And you can only save one little starfish at a time. Absolutely. And that story is so relevant. Even I'll share it in the context of when we opened South Africa um, two years ago, my new CEO there, you know, turned around and said, Ronnie, look, it's really going to be hard. It's hard to get money in South Africa. There's so much corruption. People don't trust charities. And the need is so enormous. You know, how will we ever give food to everyone? How will we ever support and I said to him, Al, actually, you might never give food to everyone. You know, you might find two little orphanages or two places that you give food to. I can tell you that the difference you'll make to those people is what counts if you can't feed everyone. And it's exactly that. It's you make a difference to one person, 
that's the person who you make a difference to and that that will affect them forever and it's better to make a difference to one person that's than right. to none yeah and that's that notion of the starfish story that hilton shares finally Ronnie, how can we help? What can we do to assist Oz Harvest? Well, thank you for asking. So there are three ways. So first of all, anyone who buys my book or by reading it, it won't, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that they can go to libraries and read it. But if you do buy my book for every book, we can deliver at least six meals to someone in need. But so money, the three ways, money, food and time. So with money, every dollar that you give to Oz Harvest allows us to deliver two meals to someone in need. So money is always useful. Time is volunteering. Um, through COVID, it became quite challenging to yes. volunteer. But even across the country, although this week there's lockdown in Victoria, um, of course, everywhere we still need volunteers. And we're back inducting new volunteers and their volunteer opportunities to work in all of our different programs. And then the third is if you know people in the food industry, if you know farmers, if you know people who've got coffee shops or different kinds of food businesses that might have surplus, just share with them, get them to call us. Even if they don't have surplus every day, when they have, it's very useful so that their food does not have to go to waste. No chef, no food owner, no food producer wants to see their food going to waste. So not everybody knows us about us yet, even though we, we hope that they do, but there's still plenty food going to waste. So share our message. Ronnie, they would have to register on the Oz Harvest to be a supplier, wouldn't they? Um, no, um, to be a food supplier, you, 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 yes, you have to connect yes. with us so that our logistics people know when you want us right. to fetch food. Or people can call one off. You know, if you, if you had a gold catered event in your home, and I say gold catered, that means catered by a catering company. We don't collect food from right. homes that is home cooked, not because it's not good, but just because we had to, from a health point of view, create a, a standard. Um, and you had food left over, you could call and say, I'm calling because I've got food left over. Will the Oz Harvest truck come and collect it? But obviously businesses that are going to do this on a regular basis do get right, registered yes. with us. And then they get slotted into a routine. And um, volunteers can go onto our site. It says get involved or how to get involved. And then there's a questionnaire, just a, a volunteer form to fill out. No one has to sign up for life. Yes, yes. You can join and volunteer once. You can volunteer once a month. You can volunteer once a week. You can volunteer as much or as little as the time that you have. If you were a grandma that's all of a sudden planted this huge pumpkin field in your backyard and you've just so much pumpkins and it's a one-off thing and she's just yep. gone overboard and she's just grown. <laughs> I love like I love it well there are a couple of things you could do you could either load up those pumpkins into yeah. your car and drop them off at an Oz Harvest office yeah. anywhere because we're across the country or I can tell you that if anyone called me and said I've got three dozen pumpkins sitting in my garden <laughs> and I'm not able to put them in my car, could you send someone to pick them up? I would make sure that a van oh, went wow. and collected your produce from your own Oh, home wow, venture. that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. Because, yeah, sometimes some, some yeah, years you only yield a couple of pumpkins and then other years you... Absolutely. Suddenly so many, yeah. Or ten. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Or... We also have on our website, um, there is a, a, a button that it says, if you need food and you can't get hold of us or you're not in an area, we, we connect you with the closest organization near you. But you could also call and say, I've got pumpkins. Um, is there a charity that, that cooks near me? And we would be able oh, to great. tell you if you wanted to drop them right, right off at someone or somewhere that could use them. But we might say bring yes. them to us. 
or we'd say, depending where you lived, you could drop them off. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Ronnie, for your time and for a wonderful chat. We wish you all the best with your autobiography, A Repurposed Life, and with all future publications. Ronnie's book is available both physical and electronic formats at any of our Inner West libraries, ready for you to borrow or log on to our catalogue and place a reservation at any time. If you would like to purchase Ronnie's book, please visit your favourite independent bookstore online or in person. Bye, everyone, and thank you for listening. And look out for upcoming digital digital contact through the Inner West Library, What's On and social media channels.